It's a path-dependent phenomenon. It's something that emerged way back. It was accepted. We've inherited it. We haven't questioned it. And so it's perpetuated. And I'm sure all of our lives and beliefs are, are infiltrated with path-dependent phenomena. And some of them are useful. You know, I don't, every morning I, I get up, I just go and brush my teeth. I don't have to reflect on it and this is the best strategy. But sometimes they're damaging. And I think in terms of periodization, it is perpetuating the myth that well, the only thing about, you need to worry about in training planning is the physical, the mechanical execution of these training parameters. And they will somehow add up to give you optimal benefit down the line. And that's, you know, to my way of thinking, a complete fiction. If, how could it even possibly be true? How could you claim to be a critical thinker and believe that? Welcome to the podcast, John. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, Steve. Good to see you. And thanks for the invitation. Looking forward to it. Oh, nice. Nervous. Been... Bit nervous, but looking forward to it. No, you're not nervous. Of course I am, yeah. People, hey, are, look, people we... are going to listen. I've got to be on point. <laughs> people are already engaged thinking JK's nervous. Um, look, no, great to connect. It's been long overdue. And, um, you know, I've always really enjoyed our conversations over the years. And, you know, so we worked together and alongside each other at uh, UK Athletics. And you were managing the support provision and providing S&C work with uh, a number of athletes and me providing physiology. I think we roomed together as well once or once or twice. South Africa, I think it was. Yeah, it would have been um, Pacho Strom in South Africa. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we, some 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 brief uh, jaunts to, to nice warm places. But it's been a while since we've sort of connected and uh, I know you've sort of taken several different moves since those times. Um, can I can I start start us off with a slightly esoteric question? How would you describe yourself? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I guess I am a fitness slash rehabilitation slash S and C coach first and foremost. That's what I have been for the longest time. Um, over the past 10 years, I have been what you might call in inverted commas an academic, but an academic with really holding on to um, some regular exposure to practice, to coaches, to professionals working in the field. So uh, what I do currently is uh, I work for the University of Limerick in their human performance in it and um, innovation professional doctors and through that although I'm not working directly with athletes I'm working directly with you know coaches physios SNCs um, heads of performance so yeah that keeps the coach in me a little coach inside me satisfied that I, I'm still keeping some traction in, in the practical world but you officially had, I'm an academic but you had a number of slashes there and sort of describing the fields that you work in and the the type of work, but so to a certain extent, I've I've sort of spotted that you've become a bit of a philosopher in some ways, or you're uh, <laughs> you're thinking about the the way we work as well as the way we think more than anything. Uh, so we can get into the subject in a, in a bit, but but you're questioning the fundamentals upon which we are basing a lot of our practice and our influence and our work. Um, but a lot of that comes from quite deep thinking in some ways. Well, thank you, first of all. I definitely have never, and probably after today, will never ever think of myself again as a philosopher. But it, I, I guess it, this is a you know, especially sports performance has been something I've been in, embedded in and totally consumed by for a long time, you know, 30 years plus. Um, and I'm curious, I'm very curious about certain questions. 
and like to explore them and like to talk to other people about them and like to think about them and read about them and and none of it is in, a, it is in an attempt to be a philosopher or to sound philosophical. It, it genuinely is just an attempt for me to figure out questions that I have had ricocheting around my head for a long time. Hmm. And and just to give people the context to, for you, you had a background in combat sports, I seem to remember. Your... <laughs> Pretty good, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess like, like most kind of, uh, boys of my generation at least um, played a lot of sports I, I guess I originally had a bit of success as a, a kickboxer at the time type of this was the era of kind of K1 for for those in in with, with a martial arts background yeah they did pretty well like national titles a couple of international titles fought abroad quite a bit transitioned down to boxing in my kind of mid-20s maybe 26 which is ridiculously late to be transitioning but I, but I had the, the background in combat sports. After a couple of years, then I was making international senior squads. It was blessed to win a couple of Irish titles at 91 kilos. Um, yeah, so I kind of traveled around the world boxing as well. Often, you know, traveling around the world to get mugged by better boxers, but it was still... <laughs> I'd have to say good experience, but very, very beneficial experience, especially when it came to, you know, a few years later, me working with uh, really, really good athletes, going to very high, high pressure situations and no, just understanding what they were going through and being able to offer counsel and advice from both a, an inside and an outside position is kind of, you know, because I had lived it uh, right, to a certain okay. extent. Uh, interesting. So, so what I'm hearing there is a... Uh, a specific transfer of lessons of when I was doing this, it was like what you were doing there, but but broadly also just an empathy of you, you had an understanding and a deep understanding of what what people were going through, ir irrespective of the type of sport. Well, I guess there are commonalities regardless of your sport or your your level. Even there is commonalities. The enemies are undue stress, anxiety, eating into things like sleep, clarity of thought, you know, and again, driving negative biochemical cascades that interfere with pretty much everything. And I, first of all, I was a victim of that because, you know, my first international fight was against the world number two when European champion, you know, and you had lots of experiences like that where you think, I am completely outgunned here. There is nothing I can do in the next 24 hours. And, you know, just living those experience, uh, experiences, I think, although I haven't talked about it before, now that we're talking about it, did help and does help relate to situations where athletes are going into very high profile, very high performance environments, and they have a bit of a niggle, or it's their first time in this particular uh, competition or, whatever it might be. So, so uh, yeah, I think it helped appreciate just what athletes are going through and all of the things outside of the training track or the, you know, whatever the training environment is, all those other things, the stress, the anxiety, how to manage it, um, coach communications, athlete relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Those things really are vital. They're vital to support the athlete's sense of not only their, you know, to have their clear sense of purpose, but also their sense of confidence. If you don't have confidence in your coach and you're in a high pressure environment, you are going to be in big trouble. Look at it the opposite way around. If you have complete faith and confidence in your coach, your support team, you have, it's a different frame of mind, but not only a different frame of mind, a different, a different set of biochemical consequences you are in a different frame of mind. You think differently, you react differently. It's about being, you know, as you know, it's, it's just being hitting that sweet spot and not being over the top in terms of uh, overly stressed or anxious. Mm. Sorry, I went off in one there. No, no, I think that's, that's really interesting to hear that because when you're talking about facing the number two in the world, I'm hearing emotions, I'm hearing, um, questioning your preparation, the, the 
relationships around you i'm not hearing am i stronger in terms of being able to punch this person harder than them punching me am i able to dodge their kicks or kick harder than them i'm hearing less about the mechanics and the the load i'm hearing more about the nuance and the subtleties and the things that will have a big effect on your performance that we perhaps overlook or that we don't we aren't are not able to measure as well that's a really good point and i think where it is well athletes in high pressure situations it is a there is a lot of uncertainty and uncertainty is the driver of stress and anxiety um, now sometimes you can't counter that uncertainty by saying to the athlete you know don't be worried about the uncertainty because of course they're going to worry about it, but what you can give an athlete is a sense of competence yes on this side of the scales there is a lot of uncertainty i do not know what will happen tomorrow what if you know they go ahead with the first goal or whatever it might be or my pacing is off and i'm i'm really starting to feel things at 400 when i shouldn't be or something like that that uncertainty will always be there, but what you can give an athlete, not in a short speech or anything like that, but in the processes you and your, uh, the athlete support team go through over the, you know, the, the intervening or the, the build up to competition is give them a sense of competence. It doesn't matter what happens. I know I can cope. You know why? Because we have been through this in practice. We've gone through the scenarios. We've trained under different conditions. So even though I have no idea what's going to happen and things might go, you know, pear shape very quickly, I do trust in my preparation and I do trust in my, in my skill set and my psychology. And ultimately, I trust in my ability to manage this uncertainty, to be competent when everything around me is moving really quick, is really volatile. Uh, and I think that, yes, you know, we haven't, I haven't mentioned strength or speed or agility or anything like that, but these are the fundamentals. Um, even though we commonly don't think of them as the fundamentals, we think of other things as more important. But I kind of think, think, think of it the other way around. We need to get those basics in place before you can ever build a platform that is going to lead an athlete to reach their, their, their optimal potential. Yeah, okay. That, so this really sort of that starts leading into this these the types of questions you've been creating over the the, the last oh, I guess 15 years or so now you're certainly active in publishing um i'm hearing that that if you if you work your way back from what would an outstanding performance look like it is going to be adaptable it is going to be competent in a variety of different scenarios um it, it potentially could be agile in terms of the response to opposition it isn't constrained it isn't boxed off it isn't dependent upon certain things falling in their direction it is it is confidence that that we've been engaged in our process and our preparation we've we've adapted and we've learned and those aspects of our preparation they're fuel for a performance they they allow us to look forward and be authentic in our confidence yes uh, i think everything you've said there i i agree with but i think it's it's not just setting a so it is setting a psycho psychological backdrop to when you go out to perform or when you go to train but essentially what you're thinking, what you're feeling sets the chemical backdrop, sets the, you know, from like recognized in whatever center in your brain, there's some neurochemical change. You get a dribble of neurotransmitter that, that drives a cascade of downstream consequences. And yeah, what you believe in terms of this is the, let's call it the uncertainty of the event I'm moving into. I can't accurately predict what's going to happen. But I, what, I, what I am confident in is that I cope. That we have worked together over a protracted period of time. We have been through the scenarios. I've been through the situation. I have faith in my process. I have faith in the people behind me. I can cope. Mm. 
Now that might, I, I don't know if it sounds overly obvious, but it's something that is completely neglected for sure. You know, and we tend to, in our world, prioritize the nuts and bolts, the numbers, the reps, the, you know, the heart rates, the intensity ranges. But yeah, but there's all these fundamental basics. There's this um, physiological, neurobiological backdrop, the training stimuli are overlaid upon. That is half the battle, but we don't give it half the attention when we, you know, prescribe training or deliver training or prepare people for competition. As an example of, you know, if, if you take warm up, so, and, and, and I know we've been there, you know, for, for me, especially, I mean, I'm very interested in things like coordination, how we optimize coordination pre, pre race or event. And you can get kind of sidetracked and go down this cul-de-sac, but they need to do this mechanical thing. They need to, you know, uh, optimize reactivity off the ground. They need to optimize stability around knee and hip, blah, 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 blah. And then you forget, or at least I did forget that, well, actually the first thing they need to set is they need to kind of calibrate their, their background emotional state, their state of thinking to the challenge ahead. Uh, yeah, and so that's just an example of mm. a warm up for me. It, there's always there's emotional cues, there's there's psychological routines as well as the, the the physical and mechanical and technical rehearsal of skills. Mm. Yeah, like that. They're very nice. Um, that integration of the psycho and physical uh, preparation as opposed to seeing that as them as separate entities that don't necessarily complement or or coordinate with each other. And, you know, there's an interesting point here. Um, and, and that is, uh, I, I think now, you know, especially the past kind of five, 10 years, you can start to see this coming through other rounds of research. You know, the importance of, you know, placebo effect is a big one. That, don't want to get sidelined in it now, but you know, placebo effect for athletes. Where if you think of a placebo effect, it is, it's not the power of nothing. It's the power of relationships, communication, good processes, security, sense of purpose. It's all those things, and it can have dramatic effects on athletic performance. So I think now in the past five, 10 years, there's a lot of science coming through that's saying. Yes, absolutely. This is really important. And what you think influences how you react and how you respond and how you adapt and how you sleep in a couple of nights time and all these things. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that a lot of the, the great coaches were onto this 50, 60 years ago. You know, I think of Doc Councilman in swimming, Percy Cerruti, or Cerruti in, in middle distance and distance running. Um, you know, good intuitive coaches were always onto this and always held as a centerpiece of their practice a focus on building the relationships, engendering trust, uh, building a training group that was, you know, that was positive. Mm. And so, yeah, so, so it's not like I'm um, saying anything new to the world. It's, it's just maybe at the moment now we can put some added science behind why what these great coaches were doing 60 years ago actually works. Well, let, let's lean into that a little bit then, because um, some of your publications around this area, certainly I think the, the article that really caused a stir, although you were subtle in the way that you presented your ideas around questioning periodization, the 2012 paper, um, I love the fact that you started off referencing the, the, the origins of planning and, and how it became so powerful for an industrial revolution, how it actually drove a lot of practice of, oh, we could get ahead if we just do some of these things, if we organize in a certain way, if we take some of that uncertainty and, and ambiguity out of our world, but activeness, um, that, that formulaic approach to creating some rules, a process, 
and not deviating from that seemed to be the the backdrop of driving what effectively became periodization as as you as you uh, uncovered or you certainly posed that as a hypothesis that when these thoughts were organized around training organization the prevailing cultural and contextual uh, way of working was to organize plan put yourself in blocks I, I wasn't looking to disagree with anything. I was looking to, to agree, to actively agree. I wanted to fall in behind the authorities, you know, in saying that periodization is great because periodization would be a fantastic solution. If it was the case that a coach could look at, you know, oh my God, with this really complex problem, how are we going to get this person to this level of performance by this time? That is a really, really confusing, complicated question mm -hmm. to which there is no possible one right answer. What periodization uh, did for me at the time was it offered me a way to mechanically align things, segregate things, organize things. There was a kind of veneer of scientific validation. There was certainly a lot of authority behind it in terms of, well, this is what the Soviet Union did and this is what this great athlete did and this is what this you know eminent professor says so so i really wanted to believe <laughs> but but you know after a while it's just like how can how can this be three true how can you possibly predict um what direction training adaptation is to go and the magnitude of that adaptation how can you predict the duration of a training phase, you know, and people often talk about the optimal duration. How can you possibly um, estimate or forecast that? And how can you, how do you know the optimal sequence of training phases? And, and these are the three kind of unmentioned hidden pillars of periodization. You have to predict the time frame. You have to predict the direction and magnitude of, tra of uh, training adaptation, and you predict an optimal sequence. And you go and you look at the evidence and it's normally, uh, I was going to say shady studies, but that sounds kind of <laughs> cynical, but let, let's just call them uh, elderly, uh, elderly and isolated studies that are conventionally leaned upon for this. Now you look at, so I, I guess there's one other layer I'll add in. In pretty much it, Every periodization article you read, it always starts off with, it's either something about hand cellia and the general adaptation syndrome. Yeah. yeah. And that is support because what cellia said, you know, back in, in the 50s was that there's a general response to stress. And it's, you know, there's a dip, there's an alarm, and then there's a rebuilding phase. Or if you keep stressing, there's an exhaustion phase. But it's predictable across people and across stresses. And that was accepted dogma and it, until, you know, even in the stress field for maybe 10 years. <laughs> in the 60s, it was discounted uh, again between now and then. It's been completely buried. So a stress scientist would never think of general adaptation syndrome only in the same way as a, an astrophysicist might think of new great work but I'm not going to use it in this calculation. Thank you very much. So there's a couple of things there. There is, we have this really confusing problem that all coaches are faced with. How am I going to plan to get the athlete to where we want them to go? Now what I have is, okay, I have this generalized theory that, I, that uh, allows you to predict the trajectory of adaptation to any stress. Uh, okay, so that is, in a sense, license for me to predict when is, something is going to happen and what's going to happen. Periodization picked up on, or, or sorry, training planning theory, periodization didn't quite exist at the time, picked up on cellia pretty early, uh, definitely in, in the 50s. Um, there was publications in track and field, for example, around the value of, of this predictive model for training. Uh, and now it's embedded. 
Now it's become, I don't think disembedded is a word, but it's been totally overturned in the stress field, in the specific field where it originated. Interesting. But it's still pervasive in our field. And when I say pervasive, I'm not talking about uh, some random people saying it. You know, in 2018 in sports medicine, there was a review. GAS front and center. GAS offers a mechanical framework upon which periodization theory is based. And again, that's available for everyone to read. So again, I think what we're left with, and it's a human thing, I'm not pointing the finger or railing at anyone, but there's an idea over here that has now become defunct. We employed it here because it really suited us. It suited our problem. We have a complicated problem. How can we simplify it? And we've kept on pushing that idea up to the current day. Whereas what we obviously, well, what I think we need to do is we need to update our beliefs. We need to update our beliefs. Now, what does updating our beliefs, beliefs mean in this context? Can I predict anything about the training process? And the scientific answer to that is pretty much no. We can take group averages, but there is going to be a spectrum of outcomes as a result of any training intervention. I guess the most uh, blinding um, recent literature on that was that there was a MARSH study in 21 where they used identical twins and non-identical twins, gave them the, the exact same simple endurance and strength. I think there was a crossover here, endurance first, then strength, or, or the opposite. Uh, they used that design and identical twins responded differently. So it kind of pulls the rug out, of, at least for me, pulls the rug out from under this idea that we can predict in any meaningful way. Now, I know I'm going on a bit here, so I'll make one other point and, and, and then I'll stop. And that point is that I think what periodization did is it provided a useful means of simplifying a complex question. And that's important. If I'm working in a big US university, and I'm responsible for 250 athletes. I can't go and spend a lot of time working out exactly what's best for this one person at all times of the season. So periodization there provides me with a way to go, okay, well, first we'll do this, then we'll do this, then we'll do this. If you're questioned, it's, well, this is the pervading theory. And, and I don't see anything wrong with that. What I do have a problem with though is dressing up what might be a convenient framework in pseudoscientific language and pointing at very isolated and a very tight spectrum of evidence to justify that. And then leaning on this archaic general adaptation syndrome mm -hmm. to give it further scientific validation. Now there's one other tactic that's, or, well, it's a couple of tactics, but there's one other key tactic that's used in the periodization literature and that's uh, citing elite athletes who used this type of periodization. Now, again, that's not, and let's not even use the word academic or scientific. That's just not a very clear way of thinking about the problem if you're a coach trying to get to the nub of it. You don't want to be misled by, well, this person did this, because we all know people who've got to the top doing completely outlandishly different things, nearly, or at least at certain times. So, so yeah, so mm. I guess if I was to summarize that particular rant, it would be, yeah, for me personally, I can understand why um, periodization emerged and I think it's fine. It made sense at the time. It does not make sense now. We need to update our beliefs in a meaningful way. We can't possibly predict it's been shown, you know, countless times, well, I won't say countless, but many, many times at this stage, we cannot predict uh, fitness adaptations subsequent to any particular training stimuli. We have, and the final thing there is that we have this belief system that if we put this framework on it, everything would be all right. And that's gonna breed a lot of inaccuracies. 
And that's what I have the problem with. The, what I have the problem with is not the basic framework, but imposing the kind of belief system that if we do this, we'll be okay. And we can, in a, in a, in a, to an extent, switch off our brains or not be open to threats and opportunities as we work through. All right, so there's about six things I want to riff off there, um, if I can. Um, I'll list them briefly and come back to the top one. The the point about focusing on averages uh, versus perhaps the variety in, in response to a standard, say, random um, controlled design study, the complexity, um, and you make this point eloquently around that the original sort of fundamental origins of that planning in the industrial phase by Frederick Taylor, that it seemed to work in simple environments, but not necessarily complex. I'll, I'll keep listing these. The need potentially for us to simplify our thoughts so that it can enhance our belief and our con confidence about decision making. Um, elite, elite case studies justifying the process, which is an interesting tangent, which are explored a little bit with Stephen Saylor um, around this and, plat and maybe this simple idea of of well how is it going how how is it going if it's if you're stagnant or you're plateauing or you're getting worse why not do something different <laughs> um, as opposed to thinking I need to adhere to a plan so those are my little points I've, I've taken from from that um, section but can I just pick up on this this interesting point that that we in sport are probably founding a lot on a um, on a principle of periodization from a field in the stress uh, world uh, and our origins of Celia in in at Harvard. But this that but they've changed. But they've they've moved on. They've adapted. Excuse the irony. <laughs> um, the, so, can you tell us a little bit more about that? How that field has moved and evolved? Where here it seems as though we've latched onto something and stuck with it. Oh well, I, I guess how the field has evolved is when it. Okay, maybe let me start this way. One of the big problems with Sally's work, and especially his early work, leading up to and including gas. You know, he, he worked with rats. So basically his experiments were, you'd be nasty to rats, listen, put them in the cold, put them in the heat, run them on, until they're exhausted and they fall down, stress them in that way. So very, very, uh, both, both chronic and acute extreme stress. And then what he did was sacrifice the rat, ground up their adrenal glands and weighed them. That was the measuring stick, pretty much. So, so a very gross indicator of stress. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and what he what he did, I, I think that, and I, I, I don't want to say it's a mistake because it's a mistake now from our kind of privileged looking back, you know, 60, sure. 80 years after, but it wasn't a mistake. It was a logical thing for him to conclude was that physiological stress drives physiological adaptation or negative physiological adaptation. What he didn't consider was, okay, well, actually there's, there's quite a lot of different forms of stress that modulate physiological adaptation. Um, and again, you know, we, we see this with, uh, if an athlete is stressed, that's one of the biggest risk factors for injury. You know, if you were to take in this uh, measure stress, you know, with a simple questionnaire, one of the biggest predictors of injury is elevated stress. Uh, yeah, so, so, so that was one big thing. And we inherited that, uh, or we translated that into our world. Again, used his generalized framework, generalized adaptation to specific demands. Um, and kind of in our head, in our cultural consciousness, translated that, aha, so this is predictable. If it's predictable, I can drive it out to lots of people. If it's predictable, I can create a, a general framework. Uh, and, and that's what we did. And there was one other point I needed to make there. Um, 
Yes, so starting with uh, this guy, John Mason in, in, in the States in maybe the late 50s, 60s, they start, you know, methods has, had improved. They were specifically medical researchers for, for humans as, as opposed to rodents. And they did a lot of, you know, exemplary work on the effects of uh, stress, anxiety, you know, all emotions, psychoemotional constructs on physiological adaptation over time. And gradually and progressively between, you know, early 60s and uh, maybe late 90s, stress researchers just pulled apart the general adaptation syndrome. And now it's the case that there is no general adaptation trajectory. Each specific stressor will have a specific signature and that signature is specific to you mm -hmm. right here and now, not necessarily even you in a year's time. So it is throwing mm -hmm. another kind of curveball into this already confusing um, scenario. Now, and, and I think uh, as humans, we're inclined to push away from, from that type of complexity. And I can totally understand the mindset that might say, you know, that might just um, veer away from that and say, no, you know what? I'm just going to believe this. I'm going to mm -hmm. believe we can simplify this. Now, my perspective is we can still do better. We can still simplify. We can still make training programs manageable. We just need to think about how we're constructing training programs differently. And when I say constructing, I'm not saying four weeks of this and then a week down and then five weeks of this. I'm not talking about that type of construction, but more about how we uh, do the basics well. What does this athlete need between, you know, okay, strengths and weaknesses of this athlete, given their objectives in nine months time, 12 months time, four years time. Okay, so what are the things we need to do? What are the things we need to improve? What do we feel are the interventions that are going to most likely lead to that success? So, so far on basic stuff, what does the athlete believe? A necessary step that we traditionally miss, and that is kind of um, doing some audit of what the athlete believes will work for them or will not work for them. Um, and then going, okay, well, we've devised a starting point. We will review at the, here and here, we will update, we will redirect. And I don't, I, I think if you work a, pr a program like that, it's just as practical, as implementable, as, uh, you know, not time consuming once you are thinking in that way than any other training program. It's just, we don't want to change. And, and it actually brings to mind that there's a quote from, there's a very famous, uh, periodization theorist called Tudor Bomba, mm. who, and in 2017, I'm going to get the quote slightly wrong, but it was, um, yeah, about periodization providing a framework for training. And if periodization doesn't work, what is left to us? And it, nothing but chaos. So it's this. Okay. It's a bit of a choice. fear, fear well, led approach. A, yeah, exactly. It's a choice being set up and a false dichotomy. You either have periodization or it's chaos. You're not doing your job as a coach. And that's completely not the case. There's actually thousands of ways you can plan, an infinite number of ways you can plan. Yeah. So, so you, I mean, you recognize this in some of your work around, I think you, the phrase was um, uh, eagerness to formalize a coherent approach. And I have lived this experience. I'm sure you have too. And uh, I have, have felt real strong urges and pressures to know what the best approach is, or at least the least worst approach. How do I not mess this up? And, um, that's, that's come from a, uh, a responsibility to an athlete that's come from the pressure and the questions that I know that I'll face from people who might be bean counting or justifying a program or seeking funding. Uh, and so they will need to justify their decisions to someone else. Um, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that pressure because 
at times I felt my decision making process or the number of inputs that I could consider was chaotic. I couldn't see the clarity from the noise of the, when I start really looking and really listening, I'm overwhelmed by the objective and subjective information. The, um, it leads me to, to, to loop back to this, the origins of the, you know, the collating of, of training records and how that generalized format seemed to fit with the culturally dominant paradigm at the time. Yet now if we think about those businesses that are successful, that the, our fourth, fifth industrial revolution, um, they are not founded on planning processes. They are cult the culturally dominant force here is agile, asynchronous, test, learn, respond to information, which is what you've just described in, in many ways. I completely agree. It is that, but again, there is that hesitancy for a lot of us to do something different. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not like every coach is out there planning in very rigid or regimented um, ways, because that's obviously not the case. But what I do feel is that there is, in a, a very high proportion of coaches, there's this, because this, the educa our education in terms of periodization, regardless of our discipline, has kind of percolated through the whole culture. And there's nearly a guilt if you're not using periodization principles. And, you know, in the example you get, for example, if you're going for a review and you don't have your Excel sheet, you know, nice and neat and ordered and sensible and mathematical in terms of here's the reduction, here's the increase, that's looked on or frowned upon as not being ready. Whereas if I was evaluating that, I'd much rather, well, what are your processes? What are your processes for uncovering what's an effective route for training? What's your processes for encouraging or for promoting uh, good decision-making among the group? Now, and that's one other thing. Periodization, as with cellular gas formulation, is just about physical training. Yes. But it's, it should also be about forecasting, about decision-making, about organizing information gathering inputs or processes where you can get diverse opinions and like you know you know it as a physiologist and me as a as a an snc or a rehab guy a lot of it is based on our prior learning how we were educated but there's a power in that historically conventionally you know and the classic one is sncs and physios you know <laughs> always arguing because different focuses, different measurement systems, different belief systems. Uh, but there's a power there if you can harness it in the right way in terms of, okay, we all have different perspectives. We need to work out a way forward or we need to work out a first best step. And from there, we we'll put our processes in place, we'll gather information, we'll collect this, we will meet again here and we will plan our next step forward. There's ways that you can be just as diligent in your organization and your structuring as you would with a conventional periodized plan, but this is your organizing and constructing flexible learning processes that enable you to adapt and change things on the ground. I'll finish with one other thing. So um, I, I, I mentioned I, I, I work in a professional doctor course at the University of Limerick. Currently, I work with three uh, folks, and they're all two. Two of them are in international sport. One is in professional rugby, and, and you know high levels like head performance type. And what they're interested in isn't training theory or medical theory or re rehabilitation, but it's how do we as a group make good decisions. So between us, you know, for the past few years, we've been looking a lot at what's happening in the decision-making world. And 
uh, they're coming, the decision making world is coming back with some very uh, good indications of what characterizes good decision making. First of all, is if this, there are traits, and that tr the key traits are, you know, yes, there's a standard of intelligence, but it's not very high for you to be a good decision maker. You need to have some experience, but that experience level doesn't have to be very high. Um, open mindedness is, seems to be critical. Now, that's a very general thing. Open mindedness, critical. Uh, lack of confidence. Whereas, ironically, the worst decision makers have high confidence. Okay. So, there's some so they kind see of, it in absolute terms. I definitely think it's this, as opposed to, I'm not sure. I definitely see it as this because when I did that before, it worked. Okay. Yeah. So it do. I can redeploy it here, and I can redeploy it here, and it will work. Um, yeah. So start to go down the cul-de-sac there, but just there are basic character traits, but there's also basic uh, tools that you can use or processes you can use to enhance decision making of a group, and those things are around. Uh, you know, disrupting how we normally have meetings, head coaches, the boss, or the, you know, if it's a support team, it might be the, the medical doctor is the boss, and then people don't necessarily all kick in, or if they do, there's arguments. It's trying to offset those common pitfalls and harness the, the productivity of the group. And you do that, and it leads to much better forecasts and decisions as evaluated by all the science. Sorry, I went off on one there. No, no, no. Th th that's really interesting from the point of view of making training decisions. So as a coach or a support practitioner, you, you're, if you're making decisions or advising, um, this idea of making reasoned contextual decisions um, as a single input versus, you know, single input laden with biases versus multiple inputs that are probably stronger as a group or can overcome some of those biases or um, or oversights, misconceptions. Um, you, you gave a really lovely example in one of your art articles about the QWERTY keyboard. It's designed to, to stop frequently used keys from jamming. And now that we don't need that because we've got technological advances that will, will overcome that. And it, it, it got me wondering uh, rereading that recently about you taking aim with this questioning uh, about how we work in our jobs and what you've sort of just alluded to is uh, the subtleties of how teams work. Um, can you sort of see some similar limitations in the same way that periodization has probably got its limitations or it's, it's founded on principles that aren't perhaps as solid as we thought? Can you can you see similar limitations about how we work uh, in our jobs, our working practices that warrant some review, questioning whether that is motivated by efficiency, effectiveness, or even just well-being? I would say I see inefficiencies in the way we work across all those measures, that, or all those phenomena that you've just mentioned. Um, I think that Yeah, I mean, decision making is one example. Decision making, forecasting, as we said at the back at the very start, periodization is all about predicting, but you can predict. You can predict in any complex environment, stock exchange, whatever it might be. Uh, or at least humans are generally pretty bad at that. And now the ironic thing is, if you ask experts how good are you at predicting the future, they tend to say, you know, 90% of them are better than average, which is a kind of a, a double whammy because it means not only can we not predict the future, but our experts think they can to a greater extent than, than, than other people, which is a, which is a danger. Um, I think that uh, things around forecasting decision-making and how you can be better um, is important. I think that decision-making training is going to be part of professional sporting practice soon. And if you think about the way we're educated in, you know, in both of our domains, if you like, 
it's like uh, the prediction is implicit in if I do this type of training, this will happen. It's kind of implicit there, but, but it doesn't hold. We're not given any decision-making training. I think that that will come into professional sport pretty soon. And, and again, as I said, I, I know a number of people across the world that are working on this because the penny has dropped collectively. Well, we can all be better decision makers if we stick to certain principles, if we adapt certain characteristics, if we train people, if we, if we team what we do in our decisions a bit more effectively, we can all be better. Uh, so, I, so I think that is something that will happen. Uh, I think the gradual move away from the training plan isn't just the physical nuts and bolts, numbers, sets, reps, intensities, but it's more uh, how do I track uh, the athlete's belief system? Because if the athlete doesn't believe in what you're doing, you might as well forget it. It doesn't care how nice and shiny it looks. If there is not trust and faith in what is happening, it, it, it is a risk, you know, from, from my perspective. And again, you know, obviously we don't want to go into, but you, you, know, you could tie that to things like placebo and placebo effects and all types of things like that. If, you, if there isn't belief, that's the first step and sometimes the easiest step in, um, in having the right program is making sure it's something the athlete feels confident in, invested in, is, is bought into. So what I'm hearing there is a little bit less about a framework that we rigidly apply to a year, four year cycle or a month or even a week I'm, I'm hearing more of uh, decision making as a as a tool and a process that will allow you to respond to the information that's in front of you, the 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 beliefs, the coaching opinion and perspectives, uh, subjective monitoring, etc. Um, that's what I'm 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 hearing from you that that actually potentially can take some of that um, nervousness away from adopting a different approach to preparing an athlete or or doing productive work um, again and, and thank you because you're clarifying a lot of things that, that i'm kind of uh, rushing through and stumbling over so so yes i would agree with that and, and, and i think that there is a kind of a wave that is going to crash and i, I think we, we've come through a phase where we've put so much focus on new technology and we still are to a certain extent, but we're looking at technology to do our thinking for us. And it can. It can certainly support it. But ultimately, the intellectual capital of the athlete, the coach, the support team, that's what makes the, that's what makes the decisions. I guess the clear um, message from that literature is it is really hard to hit above average in decision making. It's really hard to be good but you can be better. And, you know, if you may, if your decisions suddenly have an uptick of 10% over five seasons, that's a, that's a huge improvement. And there's ways you can do that, but yes, it needs to be uh, consciously focused on, and, and, and we don't do that. Mm, interesting. And so when you encounter coaches, leaders, managers, who might be applying these principles or starting to get curious about this uh, have a you know they're trying to make sense of their world they're trying to search for some of that uh, certainty and lack of ambiguity they're, they're looking to take steps forward into this different way of thinking what what's your what's your primary way of advising them oh, uh, you know i i i don't think i can answer that coherently um, so just to give you some perspective, uh, the, the contracts I do would tend to be very different. So you might drop into one training culture, take rugby as a good example. Um, and again, dependent on the coach, but it tends to be very organized, but quite dictatorial, quite hierarchical. Um, and you think, okay, well, there's the strengths there in that there's a firm, uh, all the staff know the expectations. Uh, everything tends to be clear in terms of timings, philosophy, 
and there's a lot of strengths there, but then there's some weaknesses because again, it is very higher, higher it tends to be hierarchical, very uh, all powerful head coach maybe. Now I'm generalizing wildly here. Um, you go to uh, professional football, it tends to be quite a different philosophy, but again, there's very few people who would have license to contradict the, the kind of the, the, the accepted message. Now, how a decision making, a, a decision making, you know, expert or consultant might handle that would be disrupting how information is shared. So this thing, red team, blue team type, you know, which is a simple tactic. Whereas you would nominate people to argue against a point. And that gives people license to say what they might be thinking. Or if they totally believe that the point is valid, they're being forced to double check their logic and start to think of where the flaws are. So, you know, devil's advocate would be another strategy where some one person or a couple of people will be, you're the devil advocate for today. You have to come up with the weak links, the problems. Yeah. The, the deficits in, in, the, in the plans that are being promoted. And these are really simple to implement, cost neutral. But I would think in sporting context, especially sporting context where pressure is on, everybody is stressed. And again, in those type of contexts, decision making tends to go downhill and become very knee jerk, not very taught through, even more dictatorial than normal and ultimately will lead to all kinds of catastrophic problems for everybody. So I, I, again, um, in, in terms of how we're all educated at the moment from coaches, SNCs, physios, it's very much, here's the knowledge. Now the knowledge will automatically help you to make the right decisions. Or here's this framework, this what now for me is a completely pseudo-scientific framework. Here's, the, here's this framework that will teach you how to plan. That runs contradictory to the emerging evidence. Now, for people who are busy, busy professionals on the ground, updating your beliefs to emerging evidence is hard. And sometimes you just have to kill things you love. But if you want to be the best professional you want to be, then that's what you have to do. Now, obviously, you have to have a threshold for that updating, so you're not kind of running, you know, prescribing home, homeopathic something or other for everything. You have to have a threshold, but it's your job as a, as a professional to, to examine those ideas, to turn them around in your head, and maybe to bounce your logic off someone else, but it's your, it is secure and easier and takes less cognitive effort to learn something and adhere to that. It takes a lot more to be what you could call, you know, be a good Bayesian, update your beliefs in the face of emerging yeah. elements. Yeah, that, that's that, a, that's, that's a there's a grander view there, isn't there? Of I was, I I was wrong then, and now I've updated my views. I've I've learned and I've adapted, as opposed to spending your life with one mono mono view of of how things should should go. Um, I think one of the most common trends that I hear from experienced practitioners and leaders is is that idea of asking questions and and reviewing and learning and refreshing the your understanding of the context and the situation and the demands as soon as you hear people sort of saying oh i know what this one is you can almost expect that you're going to get to underperformance or you're it's not going to quite hit the mark and you're leading with those questions and, and exploring it's got that uh, element of refreshing my understanding so that we might ex actually encounter a, a situation that's completely novel because we've unearthed the information that surrounds that that situation i again completely agree and i guess it's just most people would agree with that because what you've said there is you know it's progressive but it's very sensible but sometimes if we're to bring it back to where we started in terms of training, planning and periodization, I know a lot of people who are, who seem to 
and again, I think it's just the way we're educated with this. It's like an embedded belief. It, it's it's what I mentioned in, in that uh, stress article that, that you referenced earlier, the periodization of stress. It's a, it's, it's a path dependent phenomenon. It's something that emerged way back. It was accepted. We've inherited it. We haven't questioned it. And so it's perpetuated. And I'm sure all of our lives and beliefs are, are infiltrated with path dependent phenomena. And some of them are useful. You know, I don't, every morning I, I get up, I just go and brush my teeth. I don't have to reflect on it and it's the best strategy, but sometimes they're damaging. And I think in terms of periodization, it is perpetuating the myth that well, the only thing about, you need to worry about in training planning is the physical, the mechanical execution of these training parameters. And they will somehow add up to give you optimal benefit down the line. And that's, you know, to my way of thinking, a complete fiction. It, it, how could it even possibly be true? How could you claim to be a critical thinker and believe that? Yeah. Uh, and and you, you are subtle in the way you've presented these ideas. And I think that what that speaks to is it, it recognises the difficulty of change and that, that we, we do want to revert to something that we know and that, that change ha requires us to be vulnerable. We need support from our leaders. We also need to, to get co-support across a team. Um, we, we need to have some sort of confidence that it's going to lead to results because we want to protect our job. And I, I think you understand that, that aspect. Um, can I, can I ask you a couple of wrap up questions, John, just to, <laughs> just to, uh, um, just to see where your head's at. So what, this is such a fascinating area. And I think it's it's almost just starting, but what, what do you hope to be the legacy from your work? You know, I've actually thought of that recently. <laughs> um, and I, I, I don't know if I necessarily want a legacy. I, what I do want to do and what the work I do gives me the chance to uh, explore is, I just want to, I want to think deeply about questions that are meaningful to me and to other people that I interact with. And I want to produce a good output, whatever that output might be, you know, a paper, a, a, a thought, a, a training program, whatever it is. Um, yeah, yeah. That, and, and I work with some really good, good people uh, and I'm privileged to do so. And yeah, I, I, I like to get up and like everyone else, a lot of my day is necessary evils from a work perspective. But some of it, and I try and have a, you know, a couple of hours protected every day where it's, okay, I'm going to stretch myself today in some way in terms of how I'm thinking or how I'm writing or how diligent I'm being and checking my logic. And to do all that with the background knowledge that some smart aleck is going to come along in a few years and rubbish it all. And that's as it should be. And, and not, to, uh, not to have any ego invested in it. You know, my work so, isn't me. So can I, can I ask you then, that leads me nicely onto the next question. What, what conditions allow you to do your best work? In terms of, uh, okay, so when you say conditions, environment, you, oh, you, okay, okay. you explore as you see fit. <laughs> All right. Okay. If this is something I think about a lot, a lot, um, uh, bizarrely, you know, around a few years before that, that 2012 paper you referenced, I had never really written much I did a kind of a low impact coaching journal just because I was asked to and kind of the bill from there and I found I loved it but writing is hard work it's like writing for me is like you're trying to crystallize your thoughts and you know when, when we're talking here we're humming in hand and if you were to listen back you go oh, I shouldn't have said that I shouldn't have said it this way but in writing you have the opportunity to try and get it all right so I'm a very very slow writer but I really love the process because it forces me to dive deep and it really forces me to to stretch um, 
so I've taught a lot about process and I've listened a lot to you know podcasts about writers' processes, you know, real writers as, as opposed to, to like me. But my conclusion is, and you know, I used to experiment with well, this is going to be my morning routine, and then I'll have X number of cups of coffee or whatever it is, and then I might, you know, whatever it is, do a bit of exercise or do some breathing for a few minutes or whatever it is. Um Obviously, breathing is important. What I meant is some kind of meditative breathing yeah. for a few minutes. <laughs> I know you were talking about yeah. those morning routines of caffeine enemas and all these sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and there's, I mean, everyone's aware we, we, we've all banged up against it. There's the world of information and theories out there. But then I decided a few years ago, stop. You are not a right. You are not going to win a Nobel Prize. Where and my rule now is wherever I am, whenever I have the opportunity. It doesn't matter the context, it doesn't matter the environment, it doesn't matter how tired I feel, it doesn't matter, just get on and do some work. And kind of in a way to myself, quit squawking and moaning, and oh no, inspiration hasn't struck me, just do it. Yeah, I love that. But that, that's my routine, so it's, it's pretty, it's ended up pretty simple routine. Yeah, it's a bit like the Ed Sheeran approach of the the, get the dirty water out of the, the the taps first. Just get it down. Just get it out. Um, I hadn't heard that, but yeah, my approach is uh, definitely writing. It's shitty first draft. Shitty first draft. Yeah. Okay. Everyone yeah. has to have a shitty first draft. But I guess the key point is, I, I don't go in for routines or anything. Now, now it's just if you have half an hour on the laptop, do the work. Doesn't matter what it's like. Just do it. Love that. It works for me. Humble as ever that you've said real writers when actually, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're doing your self disservice to the contribution that you've made. Um, last, last question then, who has helped support and champion you over the years? Um, well, I tell you, I've, I've worked a lot with Professor Dave Collins and, and Dave has been, uh, a good friend. So, as you know, we worked together in UK athletics, and then we worked together at the University of Central Lancashire. And it's, it, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a smooth relationship, uh, but I think it's a respectful relationship. But yeah, he pushes me and he picks me up in things that I am not good on. Like, I'm very good on. If I get something, if I get the bit between my teeth, I'm pretty focused but I can do one or two things to the exclusion of everything else, you know? Uh, so yeah, he, he, he's been good over the years at course correcting now and again and, and giving advice. I have to say, Dave, being Dave has been mostly through argument, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but it's, it's been effective. Now, a lot of the people I work with at the moment, um, some of them are younger than me, most of them are younger than me, some of them aren't, but they're all off into different realms and they're all just hardworking professionals who, who love their, their, their world and want to push themselves forward. And they've all collectively pushed me forwards. Um, and some of them are in very high profile jobs, NFL, Premier League, and some of them aren't. But, uh, but yeah, they, they, they've all influenced me. Other than that, it's just the usual, you know, your partner, your parents, your dog, the usual, but, but yeah, um, a village. Amazing. Amazing. Look, it's been so enjoyable to catch up and hearing you bring some of that content to, to life and how you're thinking and, and questioning. And um, I know so many people, whether they, they've contacted you directly, but I know so many people who, who reference your article, it just simply makes them think differently and it makes them think again of, of just taking that pause moment of thinking actually i'm not sure why we do this and that and that can infuse across the it doesn't have to have to be periodization it can infuse across their work um and just taking that moment to to think differently so thanks so much john uh, where can people find um hear more from you uh well i i guess i'm the usual social media, uh, Twitter, uh, mostly. Uh, I also have an Instagram account, but it's infrequent, and LinkedIn. Also, if it's okay, what I'll do is give you my email. 
um, my, my personal email to, to share with people. If anyone has any comments or critiques, I mean, I want to learn about this. I want to, and it's such a big area. There's so many different angles you can take. Uh, I'd love to hear people's thoughts or where they feel there's, there's gaps at the moment. That'd be Brilliant. really useful. Yeah, we'll include that in the show notes so people can check that out. But thanks so much, John. Perfect. Really good to catch up, Steve. Thank you. Brilliant.